said I'm recording here, so hopefully everything is not hopefully. Okay, so we'll cover shell scripting uh, today. And any questions from last week, except for I haven't posted uh, the, the video yet, I finished the recording, it would, would be up to today actually. Uh, PDF files, lecture three, you're going. There are two? Oh, yeah, it's the same file. I, I, click, I click upload three times by accident. Sorry about that, I still need to go and delete it. Those three should be the same files. So pick one of those, uh, all of them should work. All right, so let's head in uh, and continue to pick up from, from, from last week. Essentially what we have is, is uh, I covered Linux related topic from, from last week, which is how to send in commands, how to use some of the environment variable. So let's actually make it useful uh, rather than just do one command at a time. The first thing that we should uh, uh, discuss is how to log into a server when you are working from, say, home, which is what we have right now, right? So let's say I want to actually connect to the computer at, in my lab, and I want to be able to actually allow that computer in the lab to verify that, hey, it's me. What happened is, uh, well, first of all, still no volunteers so far. So, so please, 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 if you have time after this class, if you don't have any class conflict, uh, please join in for five minutes to see if you can uh, at least log in. Just tell me your desired username. I'll create an account and I'll try to ask you to type in the exact command and see if you can log in using VPN. It should take no more than five minutes, to be honest. Uh, so yeah. Uh, at the end of the class, I'll ask again to see if anyone have no class conflict. Please stay around, right? Uh, so in any case, uh, let's go through to some example. Basically, I will show you one example using Goody. So I'm going to open that up. Can you see this windows going around on uh, Goody? that I just show here. Okay, so basically when you download this program called Pudi, this is what you get when you open it. Basically, it would have a, a window saying host name. Uh, one thing I can put in, because I already have a safe uh, session, and uh, basically you put in the IP address of the machine that you want to connect. I already saved it, so, so what I can do is I can just double click on save session, uh, all right, Zoom want me to save the video I just have. Come back here. Okay, so because I already logged in earlier, let's assume that, hey, uh, the IP address is 10. I don't know, 10.4.156, right? Let's say that's, uh, that's the IP address. The actual IP address of the machine you want to connect to is put here in this text box. But because I saved it already, so one thing I can do is I can double click on what I just saved here. So let's say if that's the IP address you want to save, you can click on save to save it. Now I can just double click here to load that. What happened is that this window will come in. Okay. Lock in as, that's basically your username. So my username is Rachada. I will just type in Rachada with my password. And then this would allow me to go in. This is basically what, this is the same thing as you will see, right? If you install Linux and open terminal, you see my home directory. This is actually not the SysQ machine. This is the machine that allows me to actually get into the SysQ machine from outside. Uh, it's kind of like this, like, side loop around the MUIC network that kind of allow me to walk that line between outside of MUIC and inside. And then 
if I want to actually uh, log into Cisco, so let me take the node at the IP address. So it's 10.126.125.13. Right, so I can do is call a command called SSH CTO shell uh, 10.126.125.13. If I remember correctly, I might be wrong. But if I hit enter, that would take me to the prompt that say, hey, okay, if you want to log in, what's your password? Uh, then I will just uh, type in the password. And now I will be inside Cisco, right? You can see it here that here's the machine name. Cisco, I am here. Here's my username, Rashada, right? And if I do LS, you see that this is my home folder on Cisco. Uh, you can see that there are handouts uh, for, um, from basically from the two semesters ago, uh, great from your uh, colleague and uh, senior from two semesters ago, uh, still in here. Basically, this allows you to connect to a machine that's not physically in front of you. And I can put in any command. When I type this in, this would be executed on that machine that sit in MUIC, not local machine that I have my laptop right here. Any questions about uh, how, how to log in? Basically, once we set up, once I set up all your account, after I verify that you can have a method to log in, then we all can actually access this machine. I will tell you, basically, I'll, I'll put in a manual on, okay, this is what you do to lock in. All right, so no one say anything so far. So I assume there's no question. So let me put this back and close the, close putty. Basically, when you want to close that terminal, just click the X bar and would close the, the thing. All right, so we went through the example. The next thing I want to tell you is when you actually connect to the machine, right? There's a, some form of security that, that is going on. Basically, the machine has to, can we do this? Yes. Uh, so basically, any terminal that support the command SSH secure shell allow you to connect to any other server in the world as long as you don't have IP and you have their account. Basically, it would ask for the username and ask for the password. So there was actually an instance in my lab back in Carnegie Mellon where uh, some random people from China is actually bombarding us with uh, SSH uh, requests in order to brute force password and username. So it happens, right? It actually happens quite a lot. Basically, this allows you to kind of bombard everyone else with this command. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes if you use a really bad password that are easy to get. What is one common account in every single Linux machine? Can someone tell me that? The God account, root. So one thing you can do, no, actually it's root, not admin. So basically I can try ssh root at domain name and keep guessing the password. So this, this is like a super simplistic way to hack into someone else's machine. So if you don't think carefully about the password for your root account, this can happen. And, and it's actually, there's actually quite a few ways to, to protect you against it. Uh, one thing that, that uh, actually, did, let's, let's follow this up if you're curious. So, because it is a little bit off topic from what we need to cover, but I want to kind of let you know that, hey, think carefully when you come up with the root password, because you are essentially, if you install SSH and allow people to lock into your machine for your convenience, because so that you can actually lock into your machine from home, then everyone else can try that too. So be careful, all right? But anyway, when you ask for the password, there's a certain uh, handshake, right? That, that's how I would use the, the terminology. It's a handshake between client, right now, let's name it Alice. In security, we always use the word Alice and Bob, stand for A and B. Alice is the client that want to log into 
Bob's machine, which is the server. What actually happened is that should be a handshake right, between Alice and Bob saying, hey, it's me. Bob would say, okay, let me verify who are you. And then he realized, okay, that's Alice. That's fine. Here are the keys to my house. You can get it, right? This is a concept behind public key and private key. Public key is basically a key that everyone can see the content. Private key is a key that only you can see the content. And if you study like cryptography and, and security, basically there'll be a theory behind how to create this. What you need to know for this class is essentially when you log into a server, you hand them the public key. The server would verify that that public key matched the private key for that client, which means that that person is legit. It is a real uh, 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 machine from Alice with the correct password. That's it, right? So it means that once you do this, it allows you to do SSH, which is lock into a server, without actually typing in the password. So you can use SSH to authenticate your client's key uh, without typing in the password. And here's the, the, the quick illustration of what happened. Uh, basically, you store on your own uh, SSH key generator. There'll be an uh, instruction that I'll tell you how to do it. We won't go into the theory of what happened. I'll just tell you how to do it so that when you log into any machine that you want to log in, you don't have to type in password. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I don't like to do it. Some people love to do it. it it's a fit for convenience, but you kind of lose a little bit on, okay, what if someone else uses your machine? It prevent that person, it, it cannot prevent that person from logging into the server, right? So, uh, basically what happened is you store the prop, uh, the, the key information on your machine. And when you use SSH to a known server, they would basically send in that information you store. It's like you save the password on the machine. Let's say you save the password on Chrome, right? And you, you use the website. The next time you open that website again, or open your email, you don't have to put in the, the password again, same concept. So here's how you can do it. There are two steps. Uh, first, you generate the SSH key pair. Basically, this process, this command that I, I have here, right? Oh, my bad. Uh, it's not a pointer. Let's do a pen. So basically, this particular line would generate that key. Then you store on the server side, store the key you generated so that the server knows that, okay, that's you. That's all. That's all the step you need. On your client, do that generation, then store it on this particular file. There'll be a file in a hidden folder because it starts with a dot, right? Dot SSH on your home directory. That store all the authorized key. It allows you to log into the machine without typing in password because they were just the machine you log into just send in the key and then hey, that's this where. All right, so that's it for, for uh, connecting to a remote server. What you need to do is, first of all, you can do it. That's, that's the first thing you need to realize. It's possible to log into someone else's machine using certain command, SSH. Then you can actually bypass the password by providing the, the, the host with your key, right? Once you put in the key over there, then you can log into the machine without using the password. All right, so let's come back to shell scripting, which is, let's pick it up from last week. The reason behind it is I want to be lazy. I'm actually pretty uh, a pretty lazy person. Uh, whenever I need to do a lot of repeated things, I'll find a way so that I do it once, I don't have to do it again. Shell scripting is designed for that. Basically, basically, this is what you can do. You can actually write a series of commands in a file, right? In the file that you store on your hard drive, such as something like this. Uh, 
Uh, we covered already from last week, right? There's Chibang, pound exclamation mark would tell you whatever goes after this line is a bash command. What is a bash? Shell. It's a shell command. What go after it are things you want to do. So let's say you run this whole script, right? The first thing it does is execute the echo command with the hello into test.txt. Copy that into text.txt. Don't even know why you do it, but then you do cat text.txt to print out hello again, and then remove that file. This is uh, okay, so let's just go back to the question. Which key do we need to log in without a password? Is it public or private? Basically, if we go back to the slides here, uh, here, right? So, once you have the public key, you store the private key locally on your machine somewhere, right? Then you send the public key to the server. Public key information is what allows you to log into the server. The first time you do it, you actually would let the server have, basically there'll be a method that create the verification process. We are not going to into detail because you, it requires a little bit of math and modulo and, and a little bit of number theory uh, on why this works. But basically you throw in the public key and it would magically work. Uh, theory behind it. Uh, if you're curious, uh, email me. Actually, we can we can actually, I, I would write an explanation on what exactly happened, but we don't have time in this lecture for this particular uh, explanation. All right, so uh, let's come back to that script, right? Basically, it would perform the echo, copy, cat, and remove. That's it. This is what shell script is. If you don't want to type in the same command again and again and again and again, step in the files, at the top of the files, specify that, hey, this is the shell script by using a shebang and type in the command. It's as simple as that. Then these are a way to define variables because now that I assume you, you all know how to write Python code, right? And you probably deal with variable before in i equals zero means that i'm going to assign the value zero to i which i can refer to later i can actually modify the content of the variable it's useful right uh the first thing i would need to tell you is that some certain restriction on the name uh you can use letters you can use number you can use underscore right these are some example as i said earlier when you have the dollar sign the dollar sign Specify that, hey, I want, I want the content of that variable. So this is what happened when you run the script. This is a variable. This is a value, right? That you assign to the variable. This is equal to welcome. So now greeting would have the value welcome. Any questions from the first line? The first line is basically assign the word welcome as a string to the variable greeting. Then, yes, this is also a variable. Right? This is a, this thing is a command that print username of whoever is running right now. This is a string that contains username. Basically, you can run the command. It returns a string. That string get assigned to variable. Why is that string get assigned to variable? Because you have that dollar sign. The dollar sign specify that, OK, Whatever goes in there, treat it as a string. Treat it as a value. It can be a string, it can be an integer, right? The next line is on that particular example. Date would print the day, right? The plus percent A is the format for the day. 
Basically, that is a command to print the day. Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever, right? Basically, print the actual name of that, like the today when you run a script. You put that in a variable called day. It is also variable. It is basically uh, a string that represents day. Right? And there's a, there's a Linux command. So, these two are uh, Linux command. So you can type in whatever command you want to run. It return a value. The value is assigned to the variable. Then what you can do is let's say I want to greet the user, right? So I can do echo. Uh, the the dollar sign greeting would print welcome, right? Because we just store the word welcome to greetings. So it was the, the, the screen would print welcome back username. Today is uh, Tuesday, right? If it's today is today is Tuesday, which is the best day of the entire week. That's basically what you see. Then the next line, you see your bash shell version is bash version, enjoy. You notice how this is the environment variable, right? So you can actually print things like, what's my pad variable? Uh, why do I need the exclamation mark after user? There's no need for that. It's a part of a string. Basically, let's say the username is Rachada. So what this what this would print is it would print Rachada with the exclamation mark. That's all. It, it's just a part of that sentence. So so it is not exactly a syntax. It's just a part of the string. A part of my greetings. I'll just greeting with the exclamation mark at the end. You don't need to put it in. You can just do a dollar sign user and then dot the full stop, right? Just to make sure it's a complete sentence. As in the English sentence, not a scripting. All right. Any question about this particular example? Okay, then let's move on. Uh, so one more example. Uh, this is a little bit different, but uh, first we start with the username again, like the who am I? Notice how we have this pound sign. This is how you put in comment. So pound without exclamation mark, like this is not Chibang. These are comments. Basically it would allow you to comment the code, right? And make sure it's readable. People who can come back open the file and like, okay, this is what, what exactly happened. All right. Is this again value that you want to assign to input? So this is value. Variable. What am I trying to do? Basically, input would become the path to my home directory, right? Because the, the home directory is slash home slash username. Then the output is I would assign a slash temp, which in Linux, that's where you store all the temporary files. Uh, username underscore home underscore date underscore uh, blah, 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 dot tar dot So, okay, so that's a good question. So the question is when I said dollar sign user, do that ask for inputs? Uh, the answer is no, because basically this is this is what user means. Basically, we say that user would represent the command who am I. And when you type in who am I on your console, it will print your username. So let's say I log in as Rachada, right? When I type in who am I, it would print out Rachada. So user equal dollar sign who am I basically means that I'm gonna assign the value rachata as a string into the user, the variable user. There's no need for you to actually type in the input. Uh, the re basically, the reason behind this is we want to be lazy. We don't want to type anything. 
So we want to automate as much as possible. This is how you can automate trying to figure out what is the username that run the script. Okay. Uh, all right, so, so let's go through this line. This line basically means that I'm going to assign the value to the variable called output. And here's the content of that variable. It's temp. Uh, let's say the username is Rashada, so it'd be Rashada. So assume that uh, this is Rashada. Uh, underscore home. Underscore day, right? So I guess Tuesday, Tuesday, uh, what year is it? 2020, um, day, months, and then day, and then hours, dot par, dot easy. That's the content of my output, right? So what's coming next? What is coming next? Par dash CCF, what does this do? Basically, this command perform compression on the input folder, write the compressed files, basically perform a zip, right? Perform a zip of the input folder, write it to this file. So basically, it's zip uh, slash home slash user. And create to this file, basically create the zip files, something, 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 dot tar, dot gzip. What does that mean? It means that I'm actually backing up my home folder. So then I'll just echo backup, blah, blah, blah complete detail of what the output backup files, lh dash l dash l output, right? So it would just basically print that, hey, we're done compressing your home directory. Here's the output files. Don't do this on a daily basis if your home directory is big because you run out of hard drive. But this is a, an example of how you can back up your home directory when you want to do it. Basically, you can run this script, perform a backup, you, you are done. You can save it. You can choose to remove it afterward. At some point after, say, some months later, your file name already include the day that you back it up. So it's self-explanatory. You see how this can be useful, right? These five lines of code, five lines of code allows you to back up your folder whenever you want. When you back it up, it would create a file name with the timestamp of when you back it up. So let's say you run out of hand drive. You can go back. Okay, I don't need a backup on Tuesday five years ago. Let me delete that. Let me delete these things. All right. So now that we talk about variables, let's talk about some special variables. First of all, the pound pound uh, sign specified total number. For example. Let's say you do rm file. How many argument is this? Okay, so so let me answer one of your friend's question on the on the that ha that happened on the private chat. Uh, basically, the earlier script basically back up your home directory to an output. That's it. That's it. That is correct. All right. So this RM file has two argument versus RM second is file. But if you do dollar sign pound, this only count whatever come after the command name. So this would be one. Basically additional inputs that come after the command. What if I do mv uh, file one, file two? How many arguments is that? Basically this dollar sign pound would now print 
two, right? That's file one and file two. Dollar sign zero, that's a zeroth argument. Uh, zeroth argument. That's the command itself. So in this case, it's rm and mv. Dollar sign one, two, three, four, five, whatever is whatever represents the next input on your command. So in this example, this is dollar sign zero. This is dollar sign one. This is dollar sign, um, not dollar sign. Yep. I write pound, but it's dollar sign two. This is dollar sign three. It will, by default, would dollar sign one would equal a dot text. Dollar sign two would equal b dot text. Dollar sign three equal c dot text. You cannot use this variable. I mean, you can use it, but you cannot overwrite the content of this. Dollar sign store and dollar sign at uh, all the command line argument, basically this whole thing. This whole thing would be the quote means that I'm going to interpret that as a string. The entire thing will put a, a, a quotation mark around it. Dollar sign question mark is the exit status of the last program to exit. I believe that if you if you use Python, you might have not used it before, but once we go into C, when you write a program, you can actually return after you finish writing the program. That is the status of the program. Why is that useful? Let's say you run your program, it run into some random errors. You can define that as error number one, then you would return one as an exit status, right? It allows the computer to identify what might be wrong with the program. You might have seen, for example, if you do Windows update and there's an error, something, something, oh, okay. How many of you have seen HTTP 404? Are you still with me? Any of you still with me? Basically, have you seen HTTP 404 as an error code? Yes. That basically is one of the exit status that say whatever page you want to access is not there. Page not found. I can't find it, right? The 404 is the error code of the program. Right? So this is the same concept. Basically, you run some program, it can terminate in a normal way. Your program finish normally, it might finish in a in not so normal way. Basically, it crash. Before it crash, it can throw away some uh basically the message before you die. Thing. Hey, this is my exit status. This is what's wrong with my program. Bye, I'm dead. Anyway, you can actually refer to this particular code using dollar sign question mark to identify what's wrong with the program that just terminated. Okay. This allows you to write a script that kind of check the status of the program you run, which can be useful. All right. So I mentioned quotation. So let's talk about what is the deal with quotes, right? So unquote a string, when you type in whatever, it normally interpret as a string. But if you put quotation around it, it becomes literal. Whatever goes inside the quotation is evaluated to whatever you type in, except, except when you have this dollar sign variable names. It would evaluate add variables into a value and put in the string. Uh, single quote will not evaluate that. It would treat that as a part of the string. So let's say let's say I have the dollar sign USR is Rashada. Okay. If I do a uh, test equal quotation mark dollar sign USR versus test to equal one quotation dollar sign USR. 
What would happen if I do uh, echo? Test versus echo. Test two. What are the differences? What will I get when I uh, run echo test? Uh, echo dollar sign test, my bad. About the dollar sign. What would happen if I do echo dollar sign test? Will I get Rashada or will I get dollar sign user? Two choice. Uh, all right, so let's see if I can do a poll. Okay, uh, nope. I will need to play around with it a little bit more. But anyway, so if you run echo dollar sign test, the answer is you get Rashada. So basically test is Rashada. Test two is dollar sign user because test two is only one quotation mark. It treat whatever go in there. It treat that as a string. If you have the double quote, if you have the double quote and dollar sign that goes into the string, you are evaluating the value of that variable. So in this case, test has a double quotation mark. It would say, okay, what's the content of user? It's Rashada, so test is Rashada. Test two is dollar sign user. The command in the, the quotation, like a backward, backward small quotation uh, are executed and the output will be uh, inserted as if it's assigned to a variable, then you evaluate that variable. It's a little bit convoluted here. I highly recommend you actually trying it out on Linux. That's the best way you can experiment on this particular one single slide. Test it out. You will see what I mean. Okay. There are conditional statements, if else, less than, greater than, similar to how you write a program in Python. So here is the table that summarizes everything. Dash LT, it means that it's less than dash GT greater than. So you can use a numeric comparison, compare number or compare string. So this would be used for number. This would be used for text. Basically, if you have a two number in the variable, did you want to check if it's greater than, less than, equal, not equal, you do dash the word dash greater than dash equal dash not equal dash uh, le or less uh, which is less or equal right these are examples uh 100 dash eq 50 echo what does this do what does dollar sign question mark do Print the exit status of the earlier program. What's the earlier program? Is that earlier line, right? Earlier line is a command. It's treated as a program. 100 dash equal 50 basically means that is 100 equal to 50? And that's a no, right? So it would print false as the exit status. Basically, as it says, should be uh, zero, which represent the value false. The same go for text, but when you use a text comparison, now you use the actual equal sign. So your GNU equal Unix, you then print uh, the same, basically the same comparison. And now because they're not the, the same string, right? GNU is not the same as Unix, so you get the same result. Uh, here are some examples. So let's just make it more concrete, right? Num A is 400, num B is 200. This is how you can assign value as a number to a variable. If num A less than num B, just say num A is less than num B. Otherwise, print this. So if I run this code, what do I get from the monitor? What do I get after I run the code? Is it is it 400 is less than 200? Or is it 400 is greater than 200? Yep, 
Greater than, I think I kind of give the hints when I spell out what go into the string inside the echo. Basically, num a is 400. No, 400 is definitely greater than, right? So this is false. 400 is definitely not less than. When the when things that go into this if else is a false, you jump from you skip you skip whatever go into the if part. You then go into the else, right? And you perform this, right? Run this line. And then that's it. It print out 400 is greater than 200. One more example. Let's say you want to make sure, let's say you have a command uh, CD. Right, and then you you want to make sure that's only one argument. Don't put in five different things in there. Because <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna change the directory into five different folders. You can use if else with this uh, dollar five pound to check. Basically, it checks whether your arguments only have one elements or five elements or ten elements. If it's not the case, then you can print out, hey, that's the illegal way to use my command, right? You can even print, this is how you use it. So this allows someone else who wants to use your script to know exactly uh, what to do. That's a great question. So your friend asked, what if, what is fi? Fi essentially means that's the end of my if else class. So if you do programming, uh, let's say in Python, right, you have if, right, something, and then colon, and then you have the indentation, right? This would be the block that goes into the if, and then you do else, colon, and then you have to put in tab or space bar to indent again, right? Another block that represents, okay, this go into the else statement. In Linux scripting, you tell the end of the if statement using fi and you tell the end of the else part using fi this is the same thing as the open bracket and the end back bracket in c in java as well so the fi basically means that's the end of my if or else statement block yeah that's a great question sorry i i should have covered that all right so it, it basically specify is n here, so this is fi. Yes, if there's no fi, uh, it is basically it's a missing sync syntax, and Linux would basically ask you, what do I do with this? It would keep asking for more uh, command. All right, so let's. All right. What does this do? What does the dollar sign at do? Dollar sign at is basically your whole command, right? Your, the command you type in. Basically, this check, this check if your command is the same as your string. If it's a case, print yes. If it's not, print no. You can also use loop. Uh, so you can do for loop this way. Uh, for variable name in range of things, right? So this is what happened. The first loop iteration, i is one. So this is the first iteration. And, and when you hit done, it go back once, uh, two more actually, then i becomes two for the second uh, iteration. And then this become three for the third iteration. All right, so basically that's how loop works. For i in three, basically that would just make i equals three and exit the loop. Basically, if you do for i in three, for i in 
three means that you go once where i equal three. You can also use a while loop, which is the same thing. Uh, you can actually replace the, the condition check inside the for and while loop with this, right? So basically for a while counter is less than three, you do this. This is another way you can construct a loop inside the shell script. So uh, before we kind of finalize up the shell scripting here, I have one quick question. Uh, what does this do? What would happen once I hit enter here? That's a that's a that's a chart uh, script that include a loop. Uh, and then one line that have a pipe, and then one more line that has been done. What do I get after I hit enter? I'll, I'll, I'll give everyone maybe two or three minutes to, to guess before I provide the hint. You can, you can open a microphone and, and, and then say things too, or make it interactive. I know it's a lot fewer people today because of the rescheduling. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but you can turn on the microphone. <laughs> Oh, uh, dash n after the echo just means that I'm printing the number. They treat treat i as a number. And wc dash c is a word count, but you count instead of counting words, counting character. Wait, wait, echo dash n is not treating as a number. Okay, let, let me make sure I get it correctly. Uh, my bad. So the dash n means that don't include the new line. The enter the new lines, for example, here, bash new line scripting, new line tutorial. In this case, just tweet bash without that new line character at the end. So the dash n after echo means that treat the input without the new line character. All right, so quick, quick hint. Uh, what does cat items.txt return inside that for loop? So this for loop is, it begins in the first semicolon, right? The content of the loop is echo dash n, dollar sign i, type wc dash c, and that's the end of my loop. Basically, is this for I in cat item text, right? This is the body of my loop. I would do this echo type in word count dash c, and that's it. So, what does the what does what value would I take each time you go into this loop? It would take the first time it go into the loop, it would be bash, right? The second time you go into the loop is scripting. The third time you go into this loop, tutorial. 
Then the command that you do with each time you go into the loop is to perform a word count on the, 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 the input by counting the character. So, uh, almost. So the first line would be four because in the word bash, there are four words, right? There are four words, I mean, not four words, my bad, four character. There are four character inside the word bash. Followed by how many characters are in the word scripting? Just to make sure you are up and can count. Nine, yes, uh, you guessed correctly. And then how many characters are in tutorial? Eight, eight. So this is the result, four, nine, eight. It prints the word count of each line, but instead of counting the word, it counts the character because you have the dash C in here. Okay, so you can see some example, right? You can perform word count by having the arguments that instead of counting words, Count the word character, and here is the input. This is how you can write the script to do some simple thing. You can write a script to do way more complicated things that allows you to skip a lot of steps. Here are the reference uh, for for uh, shell scripting. I find this tooling uh, useful. It's a tutorial. Yes. Uh, if there's no dash n after echo, that's a great question. So if you go back to this example, if you have no dash n, it counts the the enter the 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 new line as one more character. So you get five, ten, and nine. You, for example, the word bash just letter b, letter a, letter s letter H and one more letter, which is the new line, that that enter key that you put in to, to go to the next line. So if there's no dash N, it would print five, 10 and nine. It would include that one new line as the character. All right. So here's a reference for additional info about uh, uh, how to write a shell script. It's a tutorial that you can play around with it. And I would put it this way. I learned shell scripting motivated by more, my own laziness. The more I want to be lazy, the more I want to keep learning about shell scripting because the more I know about it, the more the fewer thing I need to do to get jobs done. Right. So if you are like me, who is lazy, you might find this fun so that at some point you need to do a lot of things to, for example, to, con uh, to, to be a system admin, to do a certain task, you don't want to log into 1000 computer and check certain folder, write a shell script. Write a shell script to do that for you. It would actually save a lot of your time. All right, so that's it for shell script. We'll skip over to the next topic, which is regular expression. How many of you heard about this terminology before? Regular expression. Okay, so some of you heard about it. Uh, essentially, there's a concept behind if I want to search for certain phrase, certain words, are there a way that I can represent like a limited form of keyword that I want to search. Why do we care? Uh, it allows you to process thing, uh, string in Linux that can encapsulate any, any, any inclusion of different, basically different permutations, different styles of words, right? Basically, it allowed me to be even more lazy. Uh, I mentioned the grep command. It's kind of like control F. Yeah, uh, it, well, grep is kind of like a control F. Regular expression allows you to put in additional symbol in the search keyword to make it cover more than one exact thing. So let's say you want to search for, for example, like dot .jpg, dot, uh, dot .png, and I don't know dot uh what's the what's the what's the 
extension for image, like, I don't know, the PDF, right? Like three of these at the same time with one keyword search. You can do it with regular expression. So it's kind of like a more powerful uh, control F, right? That, that you can use to, to type in one command and search for many, many things. So it has many variation about uh, how you use script. There's a simple search pattern with basic regular expression. We'll cover this. There's also extended regular expression, which uh, you can put in dash uh, capital letter E, or use the command E grip. It's the extended grip. Think of it as a more fancy, even more powerful regular expression. You can use F grip, with, which would use limited patterns, but it would be a lot quicker. So once you learn, uh, the more like advanced algorithm class. At some point, you would notice that this problem, which is how grep is used, is called string matching. Trying to find where your string is in a bigger string is a big problem. Think of it this way. This particular problem is actually as complicated as performing DNA sequencing, which is finding where exactly is your like ACTG DNA protein is mapped to the human genome DNA. This is the exact same problem, string matching. Uh, you can even search inside a compressed files using the command cgrep, zipgrep, basically instead of a text file, now you can search a compressed files. So here are some examples. If I do grep man and files, and this is the content of the files my file, uh, what happened here? What will I get? It would find, right? It would find the line in this file that the word man exists. Exactly, it, uh, it, it would give you the line which you have the word man. Where are those? Uh, hopefully I don't miss it, but that's one of them, right? Word. And I can't find it, but I think it's two more lines. Line three. Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, one here. All right, group activity. Uh, and then one more, if I recall correctly. And let's check what would happen. Will it print out the, the entire line? That's a great question. This is what it would print out. As you can see, it's the entire line and we get it correctly. Those are the three lines that word man exists. It would print out this line here, this line here, and this line right here, right? Double check. Okay, yes. Those are the three lines that man, uh, the word man exists. Okay. Uh, eGrep would allow for, uh, okay, Windows, please stop reminding me that I need to reboot because I need to uh, perform the update. My bad. eGrep allows you to use extended regular expression. For example, here, grep dash capital letter E. You see this, this is four. It would either search for the word family or families with the uh, uh, plural version of that word. Why is this useful? For example, in the earlier case, if you want to search for man, men, women, and women, forwards, right? You can use that one command with this or sign and put in forwards, it would print out any line. Uh, the and expert. What what would the and mean? Actually, that I don't think that's a and. Like, so, so your friend asked if that's a and expression, and I don't think uh I don't think you can actually logically represent an and. I guess if the line contain both words, uh, I never try actually. 
That's a great question. Maybe we should try it during the in-class exercise. So if you have time left, let me try if that exists. That's a great question. I, I personally, I never tried it myself. So here is like all the surrounding families, right? In this case, it would print out the word, even though it's in a plural format. So let's go deeper into the concept of regular expression. Uh, basically, it allows you to search for a specific pattern. Uh, and this is used in many, many other programming language, including BIM. So including BIM, in case any of you want to use BIM, uh, I know it's really old, um, old school. Uh, I see Wim as still a really powerful tool. Maybe I would do a quick, uh, quick example of how you can use Wim. Uh, maybe in the next lecture. I think we have a lot of time in the next lecture, based on our progress here. But uh, you can use regular expression here, and basically you specify what you want to search. It's a pattern matching, right? And then. The syntax that you put in there, the actual search term, determine what pattern you're looking for. For example, you can use this as an anchor. Anchor really means similar to how you use anchor for the ship, right? You put in the anchor, it, the ship would stay there. So the hat, the hat signs means that it match any string that start with the word you put in. So for example, you do anchor with the hat and the, basically it would map to any line that start with the, the string that start with the the, T-H-E. Dollar sign means that it has to end with the search term. In this case, the search term is E-N-D. So that line has to end with the word N. You can actually pair the two together. Basically it has to start with the, and with n for that string when i said line it doesn't really mean one line in the text files it means the entire string right it has to start with the the it has to end with the n uh, without any anchor here just match any text that has raw in it what if you start with the lowercase t that's a great question that it won't match it has to be the exact match if you want both the uppercase T and lowercase T, then you do the T or T. This allows you to check, oh, okay, I want both the uppercase and lowercase and T or she, right? So if you still want to start with the word there, then you can do hat as well. So quantifier. Uh, quantifier uh, are, are special letters that you can put in. Uh, you you know about star already. Star means that it's A and B by zero or more C. Note that it's the letter C, not any letter. Basically, it's one C, no C, any number of C. So this will match to A B, A B C, A B C D C C C, any number of C. Right, the plus signs. Okay, you confused with the last one. Which one? This one? This raw? Yes. Is this the the one you confused about? Yeah. So basically, that means that you have to exact match. It doesn't have to be at the beginning. It doesn't have to be at the end. It just find the word raw. It's it's it's, it's like the earlier example when you put in the man, right? The word man. It just find anywhere with the man. Yeah, let's just type in the word. Okay, so here, uh, let's go back to our example. The, 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 uh, the star sign uh, means that it, it can be none of them, one of them, any of them, zero or more of that letter, the letter that comes right before the star. Plus means that in this case, it has to be at least one, at least one or more. So it's A, B, C, A, B, C, 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 any number of C is fine, but has to be at least one C. The 
question mark is either zero or one. So this would map to A, B or just A, B, C. So that's it. A, B, C, two means that I want to search for A, B followed by two of the C's. A, B, C, two colon means that I want to search for A, B followed by two or more, two or more. So it'd be A, B, C, C. A, B, C, C, C. This would be up to five, right? So it would be A, B, C, C, A, B. Up to six, so five, right? So two C's to five C's. If you want to have repeated patterns that happen for more than one letter, you use parentheses like this example, right? This means that I can have letter A, letter A, B, C, letter A, B, C, B, C, letter A, B, C, B, C, B, C, any number of B and C. Then the, this would be A, B, C, C, B, C, right? There's two occurrence of B and C up to A, B, C, B, C. Five version of that, right? Hopefully this is self-explanatory. I'm just repeating the same example over and over and over. This is one of the more useful uh, pattern matching tools that you end up using a lot. Trust me, you use this a lot when you use Grip. At least I did. Okay. The OR operators, right? The OR operators is basically is an OR. You can have the vertical sign or bracket. Uh, as I said earlier, let's say I want to use the search for the word the, but I want to make sure I include both the capital letter or lowercase the. So I can do T, vertical sign, lowercase t, H E. This is the same thing. So this would be A, B, or A, C. This would be A, B, or A, C as well. So the bracket would be a word. Basically, it represents or anything that goes inside the bracket satisfy the pattern. A little bit more about this bracket because there's quite a lot of things you can play around, right? So there's one thing you can do. This is the obvious part, right? It's either letter A or B or C. You can have the same exact expression. If it's uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, then A dash C also will mean that it's either A or B or C. You fill in the blank, right? Then A to F, what does this do? How many of you know how to represent a number in a hexadecimal format? Yeah, so that, that represent a number in hex. It will search for any number that is represent in the hex format. Decimal digit. Zero to nine percent literally means that it, I'm gonna fill in the number zero one two three four five six seven eight nine followed by percent. Hat A to C capital A to capital C. It basically means that a string that that is the negation. Basically, it has to not contain. Now the hat is not begin with this anymore hat is negation. Basically, it's not a letter from A to C of capital A to capital C. It's the negation of whatever going there. It's the inward. All right. Now, you can actually use special character to represent things like digit, word, or something else, right? So these are what uh, this special character as well. Notice how we have to have the backslash, the escape character again, right? The backslash is useful when you want to tell that 
okay, whatever come after this backslash is a special thing. Backslash D means that it's a digit single character. What is that? Zero to nine. Slash W is a word character. Things like A to C. And then also underscore. These are white space. Slash S means that things like tab, space bar, new line, line break, all those white space character. Then, okay, the one more thing, zero to nine as well. Uh, and then dot would match any character. Dot mean it replaced that dot with one thing. D, capital D, match a single non-digit character. Non-digit, right? So it's a negation of lowercase d. Right? These are the same thing, backslash d. This is the same thing. I don't know why there's a repeat of this. My bad, a uh, mistake. Backslash capital S. When you use a capital letter, it's a negation of that. So now it will become non white space character. Okay. So here are some examples. What does this do? Hat pound dot star. Okay. Uh, can I repeat for dot? Dot dot really means that one character. A, B, C, tab, space bar, anything, just one. It's, it represents, it can go. And, like, it can represent any number of character, but only one item, one single character. So this is probably a good example for what does dot mean. Uh, hat pound dot star. What is hat? What does the, the hat do? The word I'm searching has to start with, yes, exactly, start Okay, so basically it start with the pound, right? What is dot? Dot means I need one character, I need one character. And then star means any number of that. So it means that anything that has pound followed by whatever, but I need at least one, one, one item that go in here. Need to be something here. Basically, it has to be one single character after the pound. What about this? Data files bracket zero to nine plus backslash dot exp. This part would map to anything that end with dot text, right? What is this part? Part is basically data. It has to have the word data file. What is zero to nine plus? Yep, zero to nine followed by at least one more of that number. It can be any number of that number, but occurrence of that. How about this? Negative zero one zero to nine plus. Basically, start with zero and one, followed by any number of zero to nine. The same things go in here. This is start with zero and negative zero and one, followed by any number of zero and nine, followed by dot, followed by any number of zero and nine again. Basically, it is just representing fractions. This basically means that a string start with Rashada. This means that a single word that start and end with Rashada. Basically, that, that, that's the exact phrase. All right, so we talk about the grep command and how regular expression can be used for the grep command.
So let's talk about this uh, fed command. It's called stream editor. Stream is basically a string that goes into your input. The, in, the standard input are things like your keyboard button. So let's say you type in a lot of commands on your uh, 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 terminal. Those are standard input. Okay, okay, my bad. So let me recap the answer for that again. The first one is pound sign followed by some character afterward, right? Because it's dot followed by star. The second example, definitely have to start from the word data file. Definitely have to end with the dot text, right? Because we have that. The thing in the middle is zero to nine plus, zero to nine plus. It, it, zero to nine means that it can be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Plus means that it can be any number of that. So this means that it can be data file. One dot text data file zero seven dot text data file seven 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 dot text. Any of these would match. Basically, the plus means that a repeat of the same pattern I have earlier. What is that pattern? Either zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it has to have the word data files, something that ends with dot text, and any number in between. This means that I would have negative zero or negative one, right? Zero followed by any number of zero to nine. So it can be negative zero, 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 one, 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 two, three. This is legit. It can be negative one, zero, one. Three, four. This is also legit. Uh, that is actually a better way to do it. Uh, this dot text, it doesn't guarantee that it would definitely end with the dot text. So it's a little bit different, but achieve the same goal. The have the 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 dollar sign is a little bit safer to ensure that my string has to end with the dot text, not anything afterward. Uh, so this is basically a negative, right? What goes in there? Zero on one. Actually, let, let me let me recap again. So if you go back, so let me. Here. The curly bracket is a little bit different. The curly bracket is not the curly zero to one doesn't mean that it has to have zero or one. It means that it can be a one single negative or no negative. So let's go back to our example again. Okay, I'm glad we did this to erase the confusion. So let me let me erase everything here to redo the whole thing again for you because I think now this might be confusing. This means that it pair with the negative sign, right? You can have no negative sign or one negative sign. So it can be negative followed by this, right? At least one number. So it can be negative zero. It can be negative one. It can be negative zero, one, two, three, nine. This part means that it also can be a positive number. So it can be zero, it can be one, it can be 12, it can be 34. The curly bracket zero, one means that I either have not no no negative sign or one negative sign. Then followed by zero to nine plus means that I would have repeated pattern of this uh, bracket zero to nine. This means that it mapped to any number with the dot. So it can be uh, negative zero dot zero, negative zero dot one, negative. 
negative three four five dot six seven eight these are all matching patterns it can also be a positive number things like zero dot zero because there's this part right negative curly bracket zero or one is mean that i can have this negative sign or i don't have to have that negative sign uh, it can be one dot zero two dot three four Oh, you can have repeated pattern from zero to nine too. So this this also would be okay. Two, two, three, three, four, three, dot five, five, seven, eight. This is also a matching pattern. It just has to be a number. Basically, what we say in here is it just have to be a number. The only difference between this this one and this one is for this we use star right here as well right star means that it can be just negative dot star means zero or more so it can be negative dot three four five that's also okay all right so hat rachada is probably trivial uh, is any string to start with rachada uh and then you can have the exact match uh hat rashada dollar sign all right any questions from here i'm sorry i i went a little bit faster earlier and i'm, I'm glad you asked that question to to make me go slower sorry about that and again when we go through this lecture if you feel like i'm going too fast please 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 do let me know because that's that's the only way i can tell i can't look at your face and trying to figure out if i'm going too fast i don't have that luxury so I appreciate you say that, really. Thank you so much. All right. So, okay, let's go back to the set command. Uh, it's a stream editor. Uh, basically, you can edit things line by line. Treat this command as essentially search and replace. It's a search and replace, right? So the formatting is this, set option, command, and file to edit. Basically, instead of grab, which would search and print the line that have the pattern, set would not print, but directly edit. It replaced the command. So here are some examples. This particular one, uh, one command would have the option of replacing the word man to women g is the option that stands for global basically replace every occurrence of this this is replace uh, this is my bad handwriting uh string it refers to string in the input file so let's say this is your uh input files and and instead of the word man what you get will become the word will become women all right some more example what does this do again search and replace globally everywhere in here this is the pattern this is what we replace This is what happened. The pattern is essentially any letters that has ing in it. Things like single, right? Feeling, entering, surrounding. Any any word that has ing in the middle, because we don't have the dollar sign, it doesn't mean that it has to end with the ing. It just has to have the pattern ing. Okay. What do we replace with? Ampersand is a special letter that basically means that repeat this pattern, basically this pattern, and then put this parenthesis around it. So that's what you get. Basically, if you run this command on this input file, you can see that we are basically putting this parenthesis around tracing that end with 
basically the parentheses will be put at the end the end of parentheses is at the end of ing so as you can see here even the word single that has the word ing inside we put the open parentheses thing right this is the part that match the pattern and then because there's a more character to come afterward the le that come after parentheses Basically, this is a tool that instead of grabbing and printing, now you actually directly replacing the content of the file. Most of the time, you would use the option S and option G. This is, as I said, global. Apply to everywhere in the file as a search, search, or this pattern. Replace globally with whatever come next. That's another. Okay, the, the parentheses ampersand, ampersand basically represent the, the pattern that you are searching. Whatever you search for, use that, put it inside, replace the ampersand with the, uh, how should I explain it? Let me, let me find a better way to explain it. So this is what you want to replace, right? This is the pattern that you want to, so this is the pattern you want to search. When you find it, replace that pattern directly in here. Change the ampersand, change to that word that you just found. For example, here the word single, right? Single has ing in the word. So the ampersand is this, it's this word thing would be going in here and then you put parentheses around it. Ampersand is a special letter, basically. It replaced, it literally replaced the pattern that you're trying to match. Once it's found, you, you put in that pattern you just found. So let's say for the word feeling, the ampersand would mean F E E L I N G. Right. And then you put parentheses around this word. Okay. All right. So for the cut command, basically, it's allowed to extract a column of data. This is a little bit uh, useful. Actually, it's quite, quite useful. If you need to deal with Excel, let's say you run a lot, a lot of experiment and it has it produce something in the form of like a CSV file, something that Excel can open. Then you have the column data, right? So you can use multiple options on this files to cut it. And I'll show you the example because I think that's probably the most clear way to do that. If I have this input, A, B, C, next line, one, two, three. I use cut dash D, dash F1, three. F13 means that I want column one and I want column three. Input files is this. So this is the result. Basically, I would cut by taking just column one and column three. All right. It's basically as simple as that. Uh, for more information, uh, please refer to the man page or email me afterward. I just realized I have about 10 minutes left. But the gist of it is it's allowed you to basically think of it as when you have Excel file open and you select the column that you want. The TR command basically stands for translate. Translate from string one to string two. And again, I will show you an example to make it clear. Here is the example. Let's say I have the same input file. This is your input file. Translate one, two, three into four, five, and six. When you run this, this is what happened. It basically go in, replace occurrence of one into four, two into five, and three into six. One more example, play around with it because we don't have time. Because I have one more example of the, the translate. So let's say I want to have the input files here, right? 
I would want to translate new line into comma. Basically, this is translate new line into comma. When you run this, this is what happened. Basically, you would get A, B, C, four, five, six. Uh, it should be A, B, C, one, two, three. My bad. It was a mix up of two examples. It should be A, B, C, one, two, and three. Sorry about that bug in the slides. All right. Your input is A, B, C, one, two, three. Your translation change new line into comma so your result should be a b c one two three without the new line one last note about the input and the output files is this if you see an earlier example we use an input file as an input to my command and this is one thing that you don't want to do This is basically the input that you're reading. And this is also output file, which happened to be the same file. This is bad because basically while you are reading the files, at the same time you are modifying the file, which means that you're going to have, have random error that can happen because you are editing the same file you're writing. Right? Think of it this way. You are going down the file to read it and then someone say, okay, I am going to create the same exact file and write the result into that. This is wrong because it would lead to a lot of uh, a lot of problems depending on what get done first. Let's say you somehow magically finish reading the file first. You can see the result in some file.txt, but then if that's not the case, you get partial results or even no result in some file.txt because someone overwrites the same file. This is what you should do if you want to do that same thing. Use temporary files. You output this into a temp file, a separate file. Then you use the move command to move it back to the original file. The dollar sign just literally means the, the, the whatever files you want to, to, to overwrite. This is a new file. This is the input file. And this is basically uh, once you finish. Oh, uh, can I explain the slash 015, 012? Basically, it, what it does is replace 015 with 012. It's, it's translate. Basically, translate the string into another string. The problem, the issue here is is this this uh this redirection where you 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 basically overwrite the same file. Think of it this. Let's say you have uh uh, uh, uh some some text files and and you modify it on Notepad. Right? You're modifying that file on Notepad, and then somehow your friend go in here and actually open the same text file and say, I want to delete that. It go into this undefined behavior from the OS saying, okay, what am I supposed to do? Two users trying to modify the files and they have conflicting command. This is what happened. Basically, what you should do is when you modify the files, you put in a temporary file to so create a new file. Then when the command finish, that's when you replace the old files. That's it. Basically, don't modify the files at the same time when you're reading the file. This is reading. And this is writing. Don't do the reading and writing at the same time on the same files because you don't know what's going to happen. Basically, that's why I put this as a warning when you play around with uh, shell scripting. 
because sometimes sometimes you use file as an input, sometimes you use file as an output. Sometimes those input and output are the exact same files. So be aware of it. That's that's a key message. All right. So there are quite a lot of uh, reference manual for regular expression that you can uh, check out. Right. Uh, I would definitely check out the cheat sheet. This is basically the cheat sheet that contain uh, uh, simple patterns. Oh, I didn't finish explaining the last line. Okay, so, okay, my bad. Basically, the, this line create a new file, right? Which contain the output. This line, once you're done with that command, you replace old file with new file basically do one thing at a time guarantee that you get the output before you replace the old file that's all that's that's all that's all my key message okay and here are the reference uh, oh, as i said uh there's a cheat sheet that you can, and I actually encourage you to check out. Uh, I think it would be useful if you got stuck with, say, assignments for this class, or in the future, you want to search for certain patterns and you don't know how to start. Uh, it, it is actually pretty nifty. Like the, the regular expression, once, you, once you're used to it, there are, there are common things like dot star, uh, the bracket and the curly bracket that that get used pretty like basically a lot of time and it can save a lot of your time when you need to search and replace. All right, so that's the end of this lecture and next the next lecture, as I said, there'll be a makeup class. I believe it's Friday. Uh, basically, whatever whatever slot I announce on on canvas. I believe it's Friday, but I hope I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, we'll cover how to use Git, and as I said, there'll be a one-hour period because we we are done. Actually, now we are done with Linux. Before we move into C uh, and how to program in C, I want to have a one-hour of Q and A. We will basically come in. You can ask questions. Uh, with it let me let's make it interactive and during that one hour during that one hour yeah uh, right now in class exercise three that should not take a lot of your time but you can spend the time asking me questions about how to finish in class exercise two in class exercise three in class exercise one and all those things all right so i hope it's more fun rather than having me just keep talking and having this like monologue from from myself uh and and let's see how this more interactive session works out when it's a q a basically as uh let me let me go back to the class website real quick uh friday 10 a.m to noon so the Q&A would be from around 11 to noon, basically that one 